On Five News, the baby boy allowed to die by his own mother. Oh, yeah, you like in the water, aren't you? One-year-old Noah Sarah Morrison suffered brutal injuries inflicted by her boyfriend. A jury says she allowed it to happen. Her partner's been convicted of murder. Also this evening, is this the end of the High Street Bank? Lloyd's closes 200 branches and thousands of jobs will go, despite the bank doubling its profits. Rage on the railways. New figures reveal the parlous state of Britain's overcrowded trains. The UK's first new nuclear plant for a generation at Hinkley Point, set to get the green light. How working in an office every day can be as bad for your health as smoking. And the baby left in a phone box with a man who found her. But what happened 22 years on? Hello and welcome to Five News. I'm Sean Williams. He was a drug taker in an abusive relationship with his partner who went on to kill her 13-month-old son and she allowed it to happen. Today, a jury convicted Harjeet Punjan of the murder of Noah. He had inflicted multiple injuries on the boy, including a skull fracture which killed him. Noah's mother, Ronnie Taylor Morrison, was found guilty of cruelty and allowing or causing the death to happen. Just a warning that Layla Hayes' report does con contain some upsetting details. Noah Sarah Morrison was described in court as a happy, cheerful toddler. But at the age of just 13 months, he was killed in his own home. His mother's boyfriend, 27-year-old Hardeep Hunjan, was today found guilty of murder and cruelty. Noah's mother, 22-year-old Ronnie Taylor Morrison, was cleared of murder, but found guilty of cruelty and causing or allowing her son's death. This was the emergency call last November. Please, can you hurry up and come? My son isn't breathing. He's he been out of his cot and he's not breathing. Is he awake? No, he's not breathing! <laughs> the couple claimed Noah had injured himself by falling out of his cot at the family home in Luton. He had, in fact, suffered weeks of abuse and died of a massive head injury, which prosecutors said could have been caused by being slammed against a wall. The day before he died, the couple filmed themselves smoking cannabis. Noah's mother can be seen drinking out of a child's Winnie the Pooh cup. The court heard they had a chaotic relationship, dominated by alcohol and drugs. It's the toxic relationship that these two, um, these two coming together, that has caused his death. Um, it's a, a relationship which fueled on drugs uh, and cannabis taking, uh, alcohol, abuse, um, some violence. Um, and ultimately, uh, this relationship becomes more important to them than 13-month-old Noah, who becomes an inconvenience to them. Two days after Noah's death, the couple were caught on CCTV shopping before boarding a coach to Scotland, hoping to evade justice. Today, Noah's father issued a statement saying, When Noah was alive, he made my life happy. It wasn't his job to make me happy, but he did. He did it by just being here. It was good to love Noah. I don't see a lot in my future without him. Noah's mother and her boyfriend will be sentenced tomorrow. A serious case review will now look at any organisations which had contact with Noah and whether any more could have been done to save him. Leila Hayes, 5 News. One by one, Britain's banks continue to disappear from the high street. Today, Lloyd's, which is still part owned by the taxpayer, announced plans to close another 200 branches and cut 3,000 jobs. The move is partly, it says, because of the economic problems caused by Brexit, but also because more of us are switching to banking online. As Peter Lane found out in Sheffield, though, that's of little consolation to some customers. Last customer out and the doors locked, but keep watching. This Sheffield branch of Lloyd's closed today under a previous round of cuts, just as more closures and job losses were announced. The bank blames the Brexit effect of lower interest rates and changing customer behaviour. As we filmed, just seconds later, the first customer arrived to find no entry. Oh, an inconvenience, massive inconvenience. Um, just have to go out of my way to get to a branch now. Are you sorry to see this go? Absolutely, yeah. Are you angry? 
Yeah. <laughs> How do you do your banking? Online, mostly. Do you physically walk into banks anymore? No, never. Just along the street at the Retro Fairy Boutique, there's nothing retro about still needing to pay business cash in, so that might mean leaving Lloyd's. I only opened the bank account myself not too long ago and it wasn't brought to my attention. If I'd have known that it was about to close down a few months later, I wouldn't have opened that account. Disgruntled customers, but a bleaker picture for staff. 200 branches were already closing and now another 200 will go. Lloyds Banking Group have cut tens of thousands of jobs over the last few years. This is a battered and beleaguered workforce and there seems to be no end in sight for the jobs call. Lloyds say that since the start of this year, the number of customers walking into their branches has fallen by 15%. The big rise continues to be digital banking. In the last two years, the number of Lloyds customers banking online is up from 10 million to 12 million. And within that, the number banking by mobile phone has risen from 5 million to 7 million. Given those figures, just how much are the closures influenced by Brexit? Quite frankly, it's quite easy to pin things on that at the moment. I think this is actually a much longer trend that we've seen over the past decade. Around half of the bank branches in the UK have closed over the last 10 years, so this is really nothing new. But what we could see is the Brexit speeding up that trend now. The trend is undeniable. Once a high street fixture, the bank branch has never looked so exposed. Peter Lane, 5 News. Jeremy Corbyn has been given a major boost in his bid to be re-elected as Labour leader. A judge has ruled that he should automatically appear on the ballot when party members vote in September. His opponents had claimed he'd need the backing of 50 MPs, which analysts had said he'd struggle to get. The Pope has stumbled and fallen as he arrived for Mass in Poland. Pope Francis tripped on a step in front of millions of people live on TV before being helped to his feet by AIDS. He was unhurt and carried on with the ceremony. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has refused to change her policy on immigrants in the wake of recent terrorist attacks. She's faced calls to go back on plans to take in more than a million refugees, but she says Germany will stick to its principles of giving shelter to those in need. Now, earlier this week, we told you about how unnecessarily expensive some train journeys can be. Well, a report out today has revealed how overcrowded they often are too. The two worst services are between Brighton and Bedford and between Glasgow and Manchester. In some cases, trains cram in twice the number of people that they're designed for. Charlotte Grant has some passenger stories. Sardines in a can. If you can imagine, look at a sardines in the can, it, it looks like that. There's not much space at all, not much air. Chock a block all the way down the corridor. No room for anybody. Not nice for people who spent a lot of money to stand all the way. It happens all the time, like it's consistently bad in terms of overcrowding. So, yeah, not really the nicest environment to, to be in, to be honest. It's the everyday reality of train travel. Unbearable levels of overcrowding, but many trains cramming in twice as many people as they should be carrying. For some time, Southern Rail Services has been criticised, with passengers around London and the South East suffering delays, cancellations and overcrowding. But today, figures reveal it's a nationwide problem, with Manchester and Glasgow among the hotspots for the worst overcrowding. And the number of us using trains is only growing. So much so that the volume of journeys people are making is now at the highest level since the 1920s. That doesn't mean the experience is getting any better. It's one of those services where at peak hours you send the smallest train. So you try to work out how to find a space in Very the smallest true, yeah. train, which is already packed by the time it gets here. It's a kids' holiday, so this is actually quite quiet. So you're lucky you even got on with your, your equipment today. So. I have to find my way in normally to get on. Um, so if there was a few more carriages or a bit more frequency, it would be so much easier. Government figures show some services had to carry an extra 200 passengers, while on other trains, during the morning rush hour, one in three passengers was forced to stand. Today, the group that represents the rail industry was apologetic. We as an industry are doing everything we can to introduce more carriages, improved carriages, air-conditioned carriages, so that there are more seats, particularly in the peak period. 
But until then, with demand for train services only set to increase, passenger experience seems unlikely to improve. Charlotte Grant, 5 News. About one-fifth of all the electricity we use is generated by nuclear power, yet Britain hasn't built a new nuclear plant for more than 20 years. That's about to change. A brand new station at Hinkley Point in Somerset, costing £18 billion, is finally about to be approved. It'll be nine years before it's up and running. It'll create 25,000 jobs. Let's speak now to Simon Weigar, who joins us from Hinkley Point. Simon, how big a decision is this? Oh, it's an £18 billion decision, uh, Sean. The old Hinkley A and Hinkley B power stations are in the distance. In the foreground here, the construction work for Hinkley C is already underway, and they don't have the official go-ahead yet, but the preparatory work is underway here, and the sheer scale of it can be seen from the air. As you say, uh, 25,000 construction jobs here will make it the biggest construction site in Europe, 900 uh, permanent jobs here at Hinkley. And those in favour say... Uh, solar energy and wind energy, you can't do everything on that. You have to have nuclear as well as part of the equation. Well, nuclear power is low carbon. Uh, it doesn't depend on the wind blowing or the sun being out to, as to whether we can run our transport systems or pump water into our homes or run our hospitals and the like. Uh, so those are very clear advantages. On the other hand, very expensive to build, which is why you need this long-term pricing deal. That's what those in favour say. What about those against? Well, there are people here who are against on grounds of the nuclear policy, but also they point to the financing of this deal, which they say is uh, madness. And some people at the uh, French company, EDF, think it's wrong too. They've uh, resigned uh, tonight. Essentially, Chinese and French money will build this, but consumers in the UK will guarantee a price per megawatt for 35 years. That could be a top-up of £30 billion on current estimates. That's why this scheme is controversial. Simon, thank you. Still to come on the programme. The Donald is not really a plans guy. He's not really a facts guy either. President Obama leads the attack on the Republican rival as he supports Hillary Clinton. And why even if you do a bit of this, doing too much of this can send you to an early grave. All that and more after the break. Welcome back. You're watching Five News. It was the word that helped him win his eight years in office. And last night, Barack Obama once again urged voters to choose hope and elect Hillary Clinton as his successor. To the roars of the crowd, he said no one, not even he, was as qualified as her to be president of the United States. And he also had plenty of choice words for her rival, as Chloe Potter reports. <laughs> Up until now, the T word has been conspicuously absent, but President Obama got straight to the point. The Donald is not really a plans guy. He's not really a facts guy either. He calls himself a business guy, which is true, but I have to say I know plenty of businessmen and women who've achieved remarkable success without leaving a trail of lawsuits and unpaid workers and people feeling like they got cheated. Earlier, it was the vice president's turn. Donald Trump, with all his rhetoric, would literally make us less safe. They also challenged Trump's promise to make America great again. America is already great. America is already strong. Obama told people they need to choose between hope and fear. There has never been a man or a woman, not me, not Bill, nobody, more qualified than Hillary Clinton to serve as President of the United States of America. A leader with real plans, the next President of the United States, Hillary Clinton. The convention erupted when Hillary herself appeared in person for the first time. Obama knows his legacy will all but disappear if Trump moves into the White House. Passing the baton to Hillary Clinton, he hopes she can protect it. 
Chloe Potter, Five News. Some news just coming into us now. In the last few minutes, police have said there's not enough evidence to pursue claims of sexual assault against Chris Evans. Earlier this month, they confirmed they were looking into an allegation that was made against the presenter in May. It related to a supposed incident involving one woman in the 1990s. If you've just come home from a long day at the office or you know someone who's just about to, you might want to listen to this. A major study has found that sitting down for long periods at work, for example, significantly increases the risk of an early death. In some cases, it's as bad for your health as smoking. But if you're worried, don't be. There are ways around it, as Minnie Stevenson explains. In every corner of Britain, for millions of people, an office job is the norm. But now a major study has found that sitting down for at least eight hours a day can increase your chances of dying younger by as much as 60%. Scientists say inactive lifestyles are not only unhealthy, but a silent killer. Physical inactivity kills more than 5 million people a year and it causes heart disease, diabetes, strokes and lots of diseases as well. So You'll be relieved to hear though it's not all doom and gloom. If you pull your weight, like at this circuits class, you can undo the damage. Researchers say an hour of brisk walking or cycling spread over a day is enough to combat the dangers of eight hours sitting in the office. I think it's about being organised, getting up early, probably making your lunch before you go to work, um, maybe getting up a bit early and going for a walk or a run, making that little, as you say, that little bit extra walk to the bus stop, to the uh, train station. Probably um, walking up the steps at work always helps. You can always... Don't take the lift. No, exactly. Current NHS guidelines recommend two and a half hours of moderate exercise a week, but almost half of women and one third of men fail to achieve even this. So how do you feel about cramming in an hour a day? I mean, sure, you can get away with half an hour a day, but I think saying, why don't you do an hour a day? Can't hurt to do a little bit more. And how much have you done so far? What, today? Yeah. Well, about, as I said, 25 minutes well, as I go into work. Well, come on, step to it. <laughs> You're obviously off to the gym now. I do about 15,000 steps a day, so that's six or seven miles. Wow. So, and do you think it's easy to fit in an hour's exercise a day? Is that an easy thing to do, or do you struggle with that? I did it first until someone says, said to me, if your health is a priority, it shouldn't be hard. Our inactive lifestyles may be hard to change, but academics say making the first move to keeping fit isn't just beneficial, but could save lives. Minnie Stevenson, Five News. Finally, a heartwarming tale of reunion. Back in April 1994, at just two hours old, Kieran Shake was dumped in a phone box in East London by her mum. She was found all wrapped up by a man who immediately called 999 and handed her to the emergency services. He was told he couldn't stay in contact, but he never stopped looking for her. And then one day, she went out to find him. Olivia Kinsley picks up the story. Kiran has been waiting for this moment for a lifetime. She's about to meet the man who saved her when she was just two hours old. In 1994, Joe Campbell found her in a phone box in East London in the middle of the night. Then she was just two hours old. Now, age 22, they can hug for the first time. <laughs> so good to see you. Today at his home, Joe told Five News the story of how he found her. I was approaching the phone box, I saw what I thought was an empty, empty chip wrapping. As I got closer, I realised it was a little baby. Um, a peaceful child. She wasn't crying. Um, she was moving arms and legs, you know, but she was gurgling. While he waited for the police, he gave her a name. April, yes. Simply because she was found on the very last day of April. He never stopped thinking about that little girl, and she was thinking about him too. I always wondered, especially when I read that he had, you know, given me presents and cards on my birthday, so I thought, oh my goodness, he must be so amazing. Always wondered what he was like, what he looked like and what kind of person he was all the time. Finally, she made a public appeal to find him when Joe saw the photos he made contact and now here they are. OK, I'm not her birth father, but she's my daughter. Of course. Because from day one, when I found her, I wanted to adopt her. Um, I was told no, but I never give up hope. 
Hope is something Karan still holds to, that her birth mum might see this and get in touch. Finding Joe has already shown her that dreams can come true. Olivia Kinsley, Five News. Oh, lovely. Before we go, Julian's joined us to tell us what's coming up on Five News tonight. Hello there. Hi, Sean. Yeah, I'll be joined by Richard Ratcliffe, the husband of a British-Iranian woman who's been detained in, Ar in Iran for more than 100 days. He says Nazanin's health is suffering after being held in prison since April. And he's now asking Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson to personally intervene in her case. We'll also be discussing the new type of antibiotic found up our noses. I'll be asking an expert how it can help in the fight against uh, superbugs. And we'll have some useful tips from a fitness trainer on how you can follow that new advice to get an hour of exercise every day. Thank you. Mm. That is it for now, though. Sean Welby has the weather next. I'll see you again on Monday. Julian's back at 6.30. Thanks for watching tonight. Goodbye for now.